Now, Shalom again, Shalom Rastafari. Ikrita for that uh, brief interruption. We're going to continue with this right here, Armageddon and beyond. Now, there's a matrix on Armageddon in 1974 in prophecy that connects with Ethiopia, Moan, Bessazem, and Negeda, Yehuda. Now, we're being told that as of um, Sunday, Sunday um, the 20th, 2012, and this is um, the Shabbat, Shabbat Shalom, Send Bet Salam, Shalom in the home, in the name of the King of Kings and His Christ, Yeshua HaMoshiach, to the brotherhood, to the brothers and sisters and the faithful, that there is um, a solar eclipse unexpected. So that's why we call it a phenomenal event. Now, what many people don't maybe recognize, or maybe they do recognize, that solar eclipses can be measured or can be predicted and anticipated. There's a certain regularity to it, and a solar eclipse is a major, is a major event. So with this unexpected solar eclipse, if the reports are correct and true, there's very little reason to doubt um, that they are true, but we just put that out there since this is something that is not on the chart of, and we had to go back to the timetable that Helena Lehman and others had produced and to other charts and just to go check certain um, astronomical charts to see whether this solar eclipse was part of the regularity of solar eclipses to occur. In fact, some say that within 2013, is a year without eclipses. So just put, putting that out there. So should this happen, this is more phenomenal heavenly signs. Now in this particular booklet right here, in this particular booklet right here, which we point out to you once again, Armageddon and beyond, which is a, um, a free booklet from the Tomorrow World's People, and we pointed out some of their literature already to you. Um, we find them to be um, very accurate. I mean, for, for Gentiles, um, they, 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 they have a, a good accuracy with the word. And some of the main foundational precepts they preach and they keep. So for the brothers and sisters who want to catch up on their um, studies, Tomorrow's World People, as well as the Keys of David, is also another recommended resource out there, produced by others, but one that we um, recommend, you know, with um, prayer and study, you know, um, to consult with. So let's just get into this for a moment on the heavenly signs. And we're going to get into the, 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 the sabbatical, excuse me, teaching for this present time. And it's going to be more. And more. So let's just touch on this for a moment and connect this. And we're still in here. We're still in um, Vayikra, Vayikra, right? Or the Hebrew book of Leviticus, which is the Torah portion um, three, right? The Torah portion three. And when we go to Emor, now another particular matter. Remember, we spoke about the lunisolar, solar. You know, the 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 lunisolar. solar. Um, calendar, the, the Hebraic lunisolar calendar, and we connected that with also the Ethiopian Hebrew calendar, and we know the Ethiopian calendar has what they call 13 months, and when you start to study it, in, in principle, it's based on the ancient Hebraic, so here, us studying from the modern Judaic perspective, we can see a correspondence within the data, and so we recognize that Ethiopia truly the true Ethiopia, the holy Ethiopia, is based on this. Now, since 1974, how can we say, since 1974, um, you remember in the Matrix movie where, where the Mr. Mr. Smith was trying to find his way to Zion, and he was doing that, he was wrecking a lot of havoc in Zion? Well, that happened in, in real time, in real life with the real African Zion as per the great transgression against Negus and Neges, against the King of Kings, 
um, the great apostasy, and that's the so-called um, creeping coup in Ethiopia, which some call the Ethiopian revolution, you understand, which some say brought the end to the monarchy, but no, it brought prophecy to a new, a new height and a new level. Some of y'all may understand that, some may not understand that, but, but study and, and find the truth for yourself, all right? You, you need to really study. If you dismiss it, you dismiss it to your own peril. We, one can ignore the history, God, and the history, but one cannot ignore the consequences. And what we're seeing and what's being manifest are these consequences. Now, the connection with um, this present um, sabbatical um, study, which is Emor. Now, Emor connects with Amhara or the Amar and also connects with Mor when you do the, the Ethiopic etymology or you get to the, the root Afro-Shemitic etymology. So, Emor here, which is the 31st weekly Torah portion of Parsha in the annual Judaic cycle of Torah readings, it's the eighth in the book of Leviticus of Ayikra, or the Orit, the Ethiopic Torah, the Orit, Zele, Wawian of the Levites. It's the eighth, right? Now it constitutes Leviticus chapter 21, verse 1, to Leviticus chapter 24, verse 23. Now we as Hebrews, black Jews, um, Beta Israel, Ethiopian Hebrews, and faithful Rastafari, as well as other Jews in the diaspora, we read this in late April or early May, right? Early May. Now, what's interesting is that we have about um, um, one more Sabbath, which is on the 27th for this particular, particular month, right? Now, when you understand, let's, see, let's go to the next Sabbath, the next sabbatical portion is known as Behar. Behar. Now, some might read Behar this particular week because they might have joined Emor to um, uh, Kedoshim, Kedoshim or uh, Kedusan, which was the last week's portion. So some of them join up in order for to keep the consistency of, um, of Torah portion readings and feedings because of the loony the lunar or loony solar Hebraic calendar, it contains up to 55 weeks. And the exact number varies between 50 in what's known as common years and 54, 55 in leap years. Now, the leap years for us from an Ethiopian Hebrew perspective is 2011, 2014, 2016. Now, Parsha Behar is read separately. Now in common years, and, and this will be considered a common year from an Ethiopian Hebraic perspective, but from a Gentile perspective, it's considered to be a leap year. Now I don't know if you understand the significance of that. That means if you are following and walking in the ways of the Gentiles, it's a leap year. But if you, but if you um, recognize it from a Hebraic or a Judaic or a true Ethiopic perspective, it is a common year. So the common years will be 2012, 2013, next year, 2015, 2017, and 2018. Now, Parsha Behad is combined with the next um, Parsha, Behu Kotai, to achieve or to help achieve the needed number of weekly reading so that when we come to the Simcha Torah or when we come to the the end of the year, the Rosh Hashanah, the Yom Kippur, all the readings would line up. So this is one of the things that need to be um, rehearsed, gone over in order for ones, as they say, to get the hang of it. You understand? So we've taught on it, but in in in, in fellowshipping and, and in continuing one's um, sabbatical studies, you know, one's sabbatical studies and, and remembering the Sabbath and doing the readings and feedings, you, one would begin to get the spirit of it. You understand? In other words, like practice makes perfect, in other words, by practicing this. But the interesting thing is this, that we, we felt we spent so much time on Kedu 
son or the Kedoshim that we might have missed, as you know from from the previous readings, if you go back a couple of vids, I think when we was around uh, Ahare, Ahare and, and Kedoshim are usually linked as one. And then therefore, one would say that um, last week would have been Emor, right? And this week would have been Behar and Bechukotai is joined together because of the fact that it is a common year from a Hebraic perspective. Now, some of that might sound a little bit complex, but it's really, really simple if you do it. Like Christ said, one who does it will know of who the teachings of the Timaharit are. Now, that's part of the 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 calendar, the the Ken Akot Ater Bamaringa, the Ken the day um, Akot Ater, which is the counting of the days, the Kuter Kuter the counting of the days, in order to line up the days, because remember the heavens. The heavens is the original clock. You see, the heavens is the true clock that helps us to keep true signs. Signs, the signs, seasons, days, and years from Genesis, the first book, Genesis chapter 1, verse 14, tells us that we don't worship the stars. We, we don't play around with so-called um, horror, horoscopes from a Gentile, white, western, or even even Eastern Gentile perspective, but we're looking at the stars as as and the heavens is is a reflection of divine time. Now, with that being said, this particular phenomenal solar eclipse that is not part of the the usual cycle. Is, is extremely phenomenal. This is one of the reasons why we began off speaking about it. And even right now, while we want to get into um, this particular portion, we think that we need to spend a little more time in touching on that and just bringing ones up to, up to speed on why it's significant and also how our divine... Um, heritage, if we keep to the true way, it keeps us in divine harmony. While if you're following from the, the Western Gentile, you will be out of timing. This is why it seems to them that this is a phenomenal event, and they say, hey, wait, th 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 there was no solar eclipse expected. How can this be a solar eclipse? And, you know, we didn't expect it. Well, that shows that something else is happening in the true divine matrix. You understand something else is happening in the true divine matrix because on earth there are great signs, prophetic signs of the vision, as we touched on in Daniel, Daniel's vision concerning what's going on in the EU and how all of that is lining up as it was before nearly um, more than what, like 40 years ago. I mean, I mean, more than almost, almost, almost 70 or so years ago, going back to 1938. So when you see 1938 is, is, is likened politically on earth, there's been a whole shift. There's been a shift on earth in the geopolitics that's bringing it right back to the Roman Empire, you know, to the Roman Empire. And this is what Hitler and Mussolini were about and Mussolini announced that the that the Italian um, the, the the fascist government that he represented was the sixth head of the Roman Empire. So Mussolini's whole agenda was to resurrect the Roman Empire. Now that was a German Italian alliance for the past. 40 or, or more years, it has been a Franco-German or France and Germany. But what, if, if, if you don't really pay attention to kind of the world news, you might not even know that it's happening. And even if you've been paying attention to the world news and are not in prophecy and don't understand the divine prophecy, you won't understand the biblical significance of this. So what we see is that what's happening on earth is causing 
since it's such a, a great seismic shift, it's causing also a corresponding sign in the heavens, that heaven has noted it, that Jah has noted this and has witnessed this. Now, with that being said, when we um, go, go on just to get a basic layout of this particular Torah, Torah reading, right, that we as Hebrews and, and, and Jews, as black Jews, Afro-Hebrews, we read parts of this parasha, this kifal, Leviticus 22, verse 26, to Leviticus chapter 23, verse 44, as the initial or the first Torah reading, or orit minbab, for the second day, for the second day of Fasika, for the se second day of Pesach. So this particular portion, um, Leviticus 22, and 26 to Leviticus 23 and 44 is the initial Torah reading for the second day, right? The second day of Passover and the first and the second days of Sukkot. Now, Sukkot is the ingathering. Sukkot is the ingathering. So, like when you hear in New Testament um, Christianity, about the gathering of the saints, the ingathering. That's based on the Hebraic Sukkot, right? Sukkot is the gathering of Das Baal, the living in the, the living in the huts, you know, right? The living in the huts, as the Israelites did when they were in the wilderness. This recalls. It's like a Moedim in the Hebrew. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a rehearsal. It's like a rehearsal. So it's almost like a preparation. So as we go through this, we're going through preparations, you know what I'm saying, as well as it's helping to condition us to Jah's way. You understand? Um, there's a little bit more to this as well that's very interesting um, because Sukkot also is mentioned in one of the Psalms as, as a valley, as measuring out the valley of Sukkot. So when we talk about Exodus, when we talk about coming out of Babylon, this is the divine, these are the divine keys that are part of our divine heritage. But first, we must hear it. We must read about it. We must study it. We must memorize it. And then when we meditate on it, we bring it into manifestation. We're bringing the vision of Jah into the rate of atmosphere, you understand? And all of Jah's creation works in harmony with those who are in that, that spirit, you understand, and that truth. So it's very, see, see, we are the key. We are really the key to this whole thing about the new world and the new age. We as the lost sheep, we are the key. This is why they spend so much you understand, of their budget and, and of their attention to keep us, um, to keep us uh, disorientated, you understand, distracted, caught up on other nonsense issue or in, in, in counterfeit illegal Jehovah worships like these churches and other things in these kind of little offshoots. You understand, well, we should be in the stream of the divine consciousness, we get caught up on these little lakes, you understand, know and, and a lake is like dead water, you understand, know we're not no longer in the living water, in the river, that, that, that river of life. So remembering the, the Shabbat, remembering the Senbet, to keep it set apart, you understand, know and keeping this within the, the heart and the mind, helps to bring it into reality. You understand? So this is the divine code. You understand? The scriptures is the divine code. As his Matthew says, for my part, I glory in the Bible. So our true glory is in the Bible, but the code, the, see, the word is dead. As the Bible says, the, the letter of the law is, is, is dead, but the spirit of the law, it gives life. The, the spirit you know what I'm saying? So we're studying the letters, but, but, but hearing it, reading it, studying it, memorizing it, and meditating on it day and night brings it into manifestation. 
You understand? That's the true higher level of the Ethiopic Kabbalah or Kabbalah to receive it. You understand? Know That's what Kabbalah means. It's, it's a receptivity. That's why Christ says, He who can receive it, he who can receive it, not all can receive this. You understand? Know not all can receive this. But for those who can receive it, he gives them the power to become the Bani Ha Elohim. And if you recall the teaching from Romans, how the whole creation is waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. And if you read in Joel, it speaks about how he will pour out upon the sons and the daughters his spirit. You see, that's connected with the so-called from the Gentile white western perspective and the greco-roman perspective that's connected with what they call aquarius the age of aquarius because aquarius is the water bearer pouring out that water so there's a pouring out of the divine spirit upon those who receive yeshua HaMashiach, our black lord and savior in spirit and in truth that means the spirit of it and the truth of it is the true manifestation that means we have to walk in this we have to learn it so that we can walk in it in spirit and in truth. Now, this parasha, Emor, which is, which is connected with Amar, you understand, know as in Amhara or Amara, as also connected with Mor, as also connected with Amir. So let's touch on this. We're going to touch on the heavenly signs, but since we're right here in this particular parasha, let us, um, let us get into... Let us get into this right here. So the first thing is, this is the 31st. So we're going to call this the RSS, the RSS number 31, right? And in English, it's called Emor, right? In English, it's called Emor. Now, when we deal with the Hebrew, right, with the Hebrew is called, right, we have, um, Right, and more, and we go like this. Right, we have and more, right, and the, and there's a dotting of it. But basically, it's A, M, and R. Read this way, right? Read this way. Now, I, I I kind of wrote it in the little the script Hebrew right there. But let's let's break this down. And more. Now, and more means what? And more, which is taken from from um, the the first verse of Leviticus 21 and 1. So let's turn our Bibles to Leviticus 21 and 1. All right? So grab your pen and your paper and your sacred scripture. Bring a willing and receptive mind for the half of the story that hasn't been told since our ancestors, the Beta Israel reached these shores of America, of the Americas, circa 1530 A.D. So here we go. We're, we're going to go to Leviticus chapter 21. Now, it speaks on the relationships and the walk of the priest, right? That's the caption in the, in the skull field. Now, it says, verse 1, and the Lord and Yahweh said to Moses, said to Moshe or Musa, speak to the priests, the sons of Aaron, and say to them, there shall none be defiled for the dead among his people. There shall none be defiled. So, so first of all, who is it speaking to? So we're getting the word from Yahweh, right? Yahweh spoke to Moshe, to Musa, to, to Moses, the head of the fraternal order of the Lewawian or of the Levites, to speak to the priest, to speak to the priest, right, the Kohani, the Kahanat, to speak to the priests who were the sons, the sons of Haron, the sons of Aaron. And what was to be said to them? That there shall none be defiled for the dead, for the dead among his people. Now, let's understand this very carefully. Now, this particular parasha or this particular kufl, which 
in our Rastafari sabbatical studies is number 31. And it's called in the Hebrew, Emor, or Amar. Amar, right? More correctly, it would be A-M-A-R, right? The primary letters, Amar. Now, Amar is very significant, right, in the Afro-Shemitic. And we're going to break this down for you for a moment. Amar, because the etymology, the, the Afro-Shemitic, or the Ethiopic etymology is very important. Now, this connects right here with Amhara, right? Now, this is very, very interesting, Amhara. Now, what does Amhara mean? Now, we know some say Amhara is, is the royal tribe of the Ethiopians. Some say the Amhara is the tribe of his imperial majesty. Some say that that is the... Uh, the, the, the royal tribe or the, the royal people. Now, there's a lot of tribalism going on in Ethiopia and there's tribalism going on in Africa. There's tribalism all over the world. And we know what the real root and the cause of that tribalism is Satan. Yeshua HaMoshi already told us. Where did Yeshua HaMoshi tell us? Let's, let's, let's break this down for you. We have to break down this tribalism thing. Because first of all, Amhara, right? Amhara is not a tribe. It's a sultane. What is sultane? Sultane is a civilization. It's a civilization. It's, it's not a tribe in the traditional sense of tribe. Many Ethiopians might tell you that it's a tribe. But they are a post-74 Ethiopian. If we go pre 1974, we'll find out that the Amhara are the people of the covenant. The Amhara are the people of the covenant in Ethiopia. And I think we need to put this right here. The people right, of the, the covenant. Which covenant are we speaking about? Which, which contractual agreement? Which covenant? We're speaking about the Kal Kidan. We're speaking from a Hebraic perspective, the Benai Barit. You understand? The Benai Barit. Right? Some would say, like I said, some would say it's a tribe. If, if it's a tribe, it's a tribe like the Beta Israel were a tribe. But the Beta Israel, there were 12 tribes of the Beta Israel. We know that, that amongst the Beta Israel, there were different ethnicities. How do we know that? Well, look at Moses. So Moses was a, was a Hebrew, passed for a, an Egyptian. His, his wife was a Medianite, also of the Ethiopian race, and they had children. So Moses and his family would be the first Ethiopian Hebrew couple on, on the divine record. Remember when the Israelites had sinned in the golden calf? Moses, Moses was told by Yahweh to get out my way. Yahweh said, Josh said, get out my way. Let me destroy these, these people because they have gone astray from the covenant. Let me destroy them and make a nation out of you, speaking to Moses. Well, Moses, just like he made a great people out of Abraham, Abraham and his wife, Sarah, right? Well, he would have made a great people out of Moses, and who? And his wife, who was an Ethiopian. So you, I, I want to show you that right there from, from Old Testament, from the older or oldest part of the Old Testament. So when you're reading Amos chapter 9, verse 7, where it says, Aren't you like the children of the Ethiopians unto me, O children of Israel? It should not be a strange thing in your mind. But let us note this. Not all, quote, Ethiopians, just like not all Hebrews, were of this covenant. We have Esau. Esau was a Hebrew too, right? But he was not of that particular covenant. So just like it says, not all those who are of Israel are Israel. You understand? Not all those who are Hebrews are of the particular covenant. Even though that is a racial identity, not all Ethiopians are 
of the covenant of the Kal Kidan. Because if they were, then what we have witnessed since 1974 would never ever have happened. But that division, you understand, that division, that apostasy was to show that there was a virus. You understand, there was a virus among the people of the cousin among the holy people. The similar thing basically happened with Israel too. You understand? With Israel too. Because, see, Satan, the enemies know that it's through that holy people, you understand? Through that covenant people that their end comes about. You understand? That their end comes about. And they can only prolong their time by dividing the people of God. You know, saying by whatever means that they attempt, whether it's a civil war, whether it's tribalism, whether it's materialism, sectarianism, religionism, or all kind of isms and schisms to keep them away from that holy covenant. So the people of the holy covenant, the Amhara. Now, Amhara means to be agreeable. In the language, it means to be agreeable, as we say in uh, what is it, Psalm um, one, one, uh, Psalm nineteen. It says, "Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be humbly, be acceptable in Thy sight, O Jah, my strength and my redeemer." Bamarinya says, um, "Wabetu, um, 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 abetu kale." Uh, let's get the verse right here. I've got so much in my head I want to share with you, but let me get the verse right here. Um, may the words of my mouth, Yafe, Yafe, Kal, Yelibe, Asa, Besitehe, Yamare, Yehum. There we go. There we go. Just took I and I a moment to recall it, but let's just check this out right here. So this, that's one of the fire keys. In Rastafari, very interesting that that's a particular fire key of Rastafari. Psalm 19, verse 14. Aber to redete med chanetim yafik alina yelibe asab befitih yamare yihun befitih in your presence, in your face, yamare of the amare yihun. Let it be acceptable. Let it be agreeable. That's what amar means, acceptable, agreeable. Now, in the Hebrew, emor, amar, means to speak. But it's not just regularly speak, but in the connection, yamar, with Yahweh, it is divine speech. You understand? It is a commandment type of speech as well. It's a speech of the command. Right? Now remember the king's tribe is the Amhara, the Amara, right? The Am, some break it down like Am, right? The people of the Hara, and some say the people of the free. So also is translated or interpreted as the people of the free. Now what's interesting is that Har if you look at the next sabbatical, the, the 32nd sabbatical reading, right, which is the next one, is called Behar. Behar. If you look at this particular, this particular word right here, right, you see that word, Armageddon? Armageddon, you know what Armageddon means? It means Har Magidio. Har means mountain. Mountain of the gathering. Mountain of Megiddo, mountain of the assembly. You understand? Know mountain of the assembly. So we link this word har right here. Some translate as free. You understand? Know but it can also be those of the mount. Those of the mount. Now we can go back to ancient Egypt as well. And some say um, per im haru. You understand? The coming forth by day, which is also the coming forth by the mountain. Remember, Moses came forth by the mountain, as well as entering into that mountain. If you look in Revelation, is those on Mount Sion, those on Mount Zion. 
also in order to enter into that mountain. Of course, in Moses' time, the people could not enter into that mountain because they were not they were not worthy. Moses could enter into because he was worthy. Now in Yeshua HaMoshiach, in Jesus Christos, we have access to the throne of God. Therefore, we have access to that mount, access to Mount Sion. So I'm just connecting right here this word Har, you understand, in this variety of various meaning. One, like Hora, to be free, and as Hor, Har, means mountain. So you have Am, Hara, the people, the Ami, the people of the mountain, the people of the free, because they are the people of the Holy Covenant, right? But it doesn't end there when we deal with the etymology, right? When we deal with the etymology on this fact right here, let us break it down like this. So we have Amar. We're going we're gonna to come from this direction right here. We have Amar, right? We have um, um, Amir, you know, Amir. Now, you know this word Amir, don't you? Amir. Well, you might hear, you might hear it said as the Emirates, right? Amir, as in the Emirates. You might hear the Arab. They tell you the Arab Emirates, which means that there are other type of emirs besides the Arabs. Think about this for a moment. The word emir means prince. This word emir means prince. All right? It means prince. Now, a prince, right, a prince is a particular type of ruler. Remember when we said that the Amhara is truly not a tribe but a sultane? The word sultane, sultan, right? We have sultan and sultane. That's the Ethiopic word. From that word we get sultan. We get sultan and perhaps maybe even consultant come from that as well. But we get the word sultan. You understand? Sultan, which is also connected to the Amirs. The Amirs. So look at this word. Ethiopically, Hebraically, Arabaically, and in a modern sense, as in the Arab Emirates. Now, there's the Arab Emirates, but the Arabs come from Ishmael. Ishmael is the brother of Israel. So if you have Arab Emirates, you must have. Hebrew Emirates. So the Amhara are the Ethiopian Hebrew princes. Remember, said that princes shall come out of what? Egypt. Ethiopia shall stretch forth our hands to Jah. Ethiopia shall stretch forth our hands to God. All right, to sing. And then it goes on, right? So we have this connection. But now, here's an interesting connection. When we Take off the Aleph, the first Aleph. Here's what we have now. From Amir, we have more. Right? We have the word more. You know, like the Moors, the Moors, the, the black Moors, they also call them what? They call them the black, uh, right? We have the black Moors, right? They're also known, if you study the history, the Black Amors are also known as Ethiopians. The Moors also in, in history are called Ethiopians or Abisha, Habesh, Abish, Abish, which is another way of referring to the particular people of that region of the East, and in particular that region of East Africa and the so-called Middle East or Arabia. So this word is common to both sides of the Abrahamic family, to the Ethiopian Hebrews, you understand, and the Ethiopian princes, or the Ethiopian rulers, and the Ethiopic monarchy, as well as the Arab emirates or the Arab princes. So we have two type of princes, don't we? We have, and they both now, notice this, they both connect with Abraham. They both are part of the family of Abraham, which is a very interesting connection. So when we're speaking about this particular portion here, 
in 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 Leviticus where it says to speak speak to the priests, the sons of Aaron, and say to them, There shall none be defiled for the dead among his people. Now, many in an Old Testament sense will say, Well, that was dealing with when one had a relative, family, or relation, and they died, it, they didn't have undertakers. They didn't have what people have today, professional, or professional guild or class of, of so-called undertakers, not even like there was in Egypt where, where they came out from. You understand? So now if the relative passed away, they themselves would have to do the the justice, as it were, of preparing the body. That means anointing the body, washing the body, wrapping the body, and burying the body, similar to what we have in the New Testament sense with Yeshua HaMoshiach after the crucifixion. You understand? The, remember the woman going to the tomb early in the morning, carrying the oils and the spices to prepare the body of the Messiah to prepare the body of Yeshua. But when they got there, there was no body. But the point is that they were going to prepare the body because it was for the family, the loved ones, the close of relations. Now notice, it was mainly the woman that were going forward to do that, not the man. Now, that is because of what we have here. You see where it says, to speak to the priest, the sons of Aaron, that none shall defile, none shall be defiled for the dead among thy people, among among his among his people. But then there's a little a little, as they say, a little caveat. There's a little caveat here in verse two. But for his kin that is near to him, that is for his mother and for his father and for his son and for his daughter, and for his brother, and for his sister, a virgin, if his sister is a virgin, if not, then, then her, her old man they should take care of it, or her family, that is nigh to him, that is near, that is karup, that is near to him, which hath, which hath had no husband, which has had no husband for her, may he be defiled. So it's saying now for her he may be defiled. So there's there there are certain near of kin according to this particular word here where where the priest may be defiled. You see, so it's not just a woman who has menstruation or, you know, like some would just say it's just no. A priest can also become defiled. You understand? A male can become defiled, male or female. So don't believe that hype that it's just, oh, when the woman has a menstruation, then she's so unclean, so forth. It's also a man. A man also has issues, and it, it speaks about it, particularly in this book, Leviticus. And as you study it, you begin to recognize that a lot of the stuff that we heard about the sexism in the Bible was just more part of Satanistic propaganda. You understand? When you get to study it for yourself, you get to find out the truth and, and, and the fullness and the context of it. Now, it goes on to say, but he shall not defile himself. He shall not defile himself being a chief man among his people to profane himself. And they shall not make baldness upon their heads. Neither shall they shave off the corner of their beard. So no goatees. Basically, that's another one. No, no little goatees, like look like a goat. You understand? Don't shave off the corner of their beard, nor make any cuttings, nor make any cuttings in their flesh. So when you look in different tribalistic practices, they did this. There were various different type of ceremonies different peoples did according to their beliefs, so forth and so on, and their custom when a loved one or near of kin passed away. Verse 6 says, 21 and 6 says, they shall be holy, kedus. They shall be kedus. What is kedus? What's the meaning of kedus? 
holy. What does holy mean? Actively to be set apart, to be set apart for Jah and Jah's service to their God, to Ha Elohim, and not profane the name of their God, not to profane the Hashem, Baruchu. For the offerings of Yahweh made by fire and the bread of their God they do offer. So the reason why they're not to profane themselves is because they present the offerings by fire. They are dealing with the holy fire. And even the scripture says, our God is a consuming fire. And now the priests have that have that right and that privilege, you understand, to make the offerings by fire and the bread of their God they do offer. Therefore, they shall be caduce. So they are holy, not just because they call themselves holy or they are holy moly, you understand, but because of their being set apart for a particular service. And here it's speaking of the service, the offerings made by fire, the offerings of Yahweh made by fire, and the bread of their God. And we say the lamb's bread. And you can see that whole connection even in the Kana Bush, the Kana Besom, both the fire, you understand, as well as the bread. You can see that connection. Therefore, they shall be caduce. They shall not take a wife that is a whore. So let us understand this carefully. Here it is speaking to the priests. Now people will say, well, that's, that's Old Testament. Why is that significant? Why is this portion here in Emor, the 31st portion, Emor? Remember the connection that we've made. And more, in this context, the Hebraic context, it means to speak. Speaking in an authoritative sense, you're giving a divine ordinance, a divine command. It's linked with the Amar. Amar, we find in the Amharic Bible, in Psalm 19, the Mesmura Dawit, in the Keys of Dawit, verse 14, where it says, where it, it is speaking to um, Bethite, that the words of my mouth, Yafe, Yafe, the words of my, my mouth, the opening of the mouth, the words of my mouth, and the meditation of my heart, the thought, the thinking of my heart. You see the connection? We can connect that with Romans 10.10, 10, where it speaks about how... Um, um, sal uh, uh, how how salvation um, through 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 speaking through speaking let's let's get this right here let's get this right here um, that one believes in their heart right right one believes in their heart let's get the translation for with the heart man believeth man momenteth man admits to righteousness, that means being in a right, in the ma'at, the right alignment. And when we say righteousness, righteousness is like saying you don't have a felonious charge or the felonious charge has been taken away. You, you are no longer a, a criminal in the divine sight, in the sight of his holiness, of his, of his righteousness. You are in a right relationship. Romans 10.10, 10, for with the heart man my menace to righteousness, to, 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 to siddik in that, to siddik. And with the mouth, confession is made. With the mouth, afe, with the kai, the pet. With the mouth, confession, that means confessing, speaking, proclaiming, as we proclaim the truth. Not just stand on the soapbox or whatever, but as we speak the truth in our life and the truth of Jah in our life and be a witness with our mouth based on what we, my men, you understand, what we admit in our heart, this leads us now to salvation. So unlike what you might have heard, that just salvation is, is just saying Jesus, it's more than that. And, and, and it's based on the testimony of Yeshua. 
You understand? Testimony of Yeshua. Many of these preachers and pastors and others are doing the 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 they hear as a disservice because they're not teaching and proclaiming the fullness, the holisticness, the holiness of the word. They're dumbing it down. They're giving people like a bootleg version and not the fullness of it because they figure, well, if they give the people the, the fullness of it, maybe the people might not, you know, be injured. I don't know what they're thinking, basically. Whatever they're thinking is obviously not the right meditation. Let's make the words of I and I mouth and the meditation of I and I heart be acceptable. Besite yamare yuhun. May it be yamare. May it be of the amare. May it be acceptable. You understand? And this is speaking of the am, um, the true amhara, um, the people, the amharas, the farai, the people of the new covenant, the free people, the people of Mount Sion, the people of the har. You understand? The people of the har, as in har megidio, har, har means mount. Now, as we break this word down, amar. Amir and Mir means princes. Psalm 68, verse 31, Princes shall come out of Egypt. Ethiopia shall stretch forth her hands to God. So then we also have from the Amar, we have more, a more, a black Amor. You understand? So the whole Ethiopian Hebrew connection can be seen within this etymology, this Afro-Shemitic etymology coming from the Emor, Amma, Amhara, people of the Holy Covenant, people of the free, people of the Mount, Amar, Amir, Emir, Prince, Moor, Black Amor. So you see that link right there? Now, interesting that he is speaking about the priest. Now, people say, well, you're saying Prince, but then you're saying priests. What's the connection between the princes and these priests? Now, if one asks that particular question, we need to go to Revelation for a quick moment. And let's go to Revelation chapter 1. Turn your Bibles to Revelation chapter 1. I want to show you what the real link of this is in the Word. Now, when we get to Revelation chapter 1, verse 4, we have Johannes. John, Johannes, and the interpretation of Johannes would mean Eo or Yah or Jah, Hana. Jah is gracious or the grace of Jah. So this book of Revelation is the vision of Jah's grace. This is why it says in the first, in the first three verses, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him, to shew to his servants. To show to who? To show to his servants. This is to show to just everybody. That's why everybody's not into it. Everybody can't get it. Because if they're not his servants, you understand, there is no receptivity. The servant, I and I, as his servant, like the priest, remember, like the priest, the priest do John's what? They do his service, right? His service. The, the offering to John, you understand, by fire and, and the bread of their God. So it says, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to shew to his servants things which must shortly come to pass, things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel, his Melloc, to his servant John. So you see the process? It's actually the revelation of Jesus Christ, of Yeshua HaMoshiach, which is Jah, God, Ha Elohim, his father, our father, gave to our elder brother, our big black brother, Yeshua HaMoshiach, to do what? To show, to show it to his what? His servants. Whose servants? The servants of our Lord and Savior, Yeshua HaMoshiach. What? The things which must shortly come to pass. Now, some will say, but it's been like uh, thousands of years. But still, a thousand years with Jah is as a day. So it's still a short time. You, you over, we have to look at the perspective of the giver. Not from our little finite nonsense, you understand the world of sin perspective, but from his, from his divine, look at it his way. Look at it from John's way, not from our own um, 
way or ways. And he sent and signified it by his angel. So he sent it. Who sent it? Yeshua sent it by his angel. Yeshua has an angel. And so he sent it by his melach to his servant. To his what? His servant, Johannes, John, who bear record of the word of God. So John did what? He bear shema. He bear record. He bear witness of the word of Jah. And the testimony of Joshua of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. So notice this trifold witness. He bore he bore record of the word of God, right? The oracle of Jah, of the testimony of Yeshua HaMoshiach, and of all things that he saw. Of all the things that he saw. Verse three, blesses he that readeth. So we get a blessing, brothers and sisters, from reading this book. One would say, but I don't understand all of it. Still, get familiar with it from reading. Remember the fivefold steps. First, you must hear the word, read the word, study the word, memorize the word, and then meditate on that word day and night, and you will begin to understand it. You will comprehend it in spirit and in truth. So blessed is he that readeth, but you still get a blessing. Barakat, for reading. Baruch, Baruch, for reading. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear, and those who hear. So the one who reads gets blessed, and those of you who hear also get a blessing. And this is, this is in this book, Revelation, one of the least dealt with books in the Bible for Christians, but yet one of the most important books. For Christians, especially in this present time, it's like Christians before were trying to figure it out, although it was still sealed up. Now it's being unsealed, and Christians don't deal with it that much. The pastors and the preachers don't don't say, uh, brothers and sisters, we're going we're gonna to start studying Revelation in, in seriousness. No, they say it's a book of symbols we can't understand, and it's, you know. Anyway, but. What the word says is, blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy. Not some other prophecy. You know what I'm saying? Not even Nostradamus and his quiet trains or this or that. But that hear the words of this tindi, this prophecy, and keep. So that to keep the Sabbath holy, that keep, that protect those things which are written therein. For the time is at hand. The vision all vision is being fulfilled. The time is at hand. So here's the salutation right here. John, uh, John um, verse 4, John to the seven churches, which are in Asia. Grace, this is how he saluted them. He said, grace be to you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come. And from the seven spirits, which are before the throne, before his throne. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth. You see that word right there, Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMoshiach is what? He is a mere. He is a mere. He is a mar. He is prince. He is prince of what? He is prince, it says of the kings of the earth. Now, a king, by, by virtue of station, is higher than a prince. But Yeshua HaMoshiach, he is the prince of all the kings of the earth. Check that out. You understand? It's like, it's like the last shall be first. To him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. That's atonement right there. That's Yom Kippur. Atonement. He washed us from our sin, from our ignorance in his own life. So as we be a witness and learn of him, you know, of his life, he is washing away our sin, our ignorance by his blood, which is his life, because blood equals life, and hath made us kings and priests to God and his Father. So it has made us what? Kings and priests. Now, the word kings, the phrase kings and, and, and priests, if you look in the margin of the Schofield, it says a kingdom of a priest. 
In other words, it's really the proper translation from the Amharic would be a kingdom of the priesthood has made a, us a kingdom. We're a government, but of what? Of the priesthood. Do you see that link now? We're a government of the priesthood. And we speak about Malachi, Sedek, but now the code here is in Leviticus. When we look in the book of Leviticus, right, we are learning more of the code when it says in this Torah portion, reading and feeding from Leviticus 21, that, and the Lord said to Moses, speak to the priests, the sons of Aaron, and say to them, there shall, be, there shall none be defiled for the dead among his people. None shall be defiled, but then there's an exception made. Now, let's just get through this right here where it says, And he has made us kings and priests, or a kingdom of the priesthood, to God, verse 6, to God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion for ever and ever. Amen. You don't hear Christians, most Christians, majority of nominal Christians speaking like that. What John is doing right here, he's writing to churches. And, and, and here's how he makes his greeting. Grace be to you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come. The one which is, right, which was, right, and which is to come from the triune God. From the triune God, right, from, from the triune God. Or Abba Kedus, Edomawi Haile Selassie, the first power of the Trinity and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. So speaking of the, the one which was, which is, which is to come from the seven spirits, so there are seven before, before the triune God, and then it says from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, to him that loved us and washed us from our sin in his own blood and hath made us kings and priests or a kingdom of the priesthood to God and his father or to his God father to Kedus Abatach and to Abba Kedus. To him be glory and dominion for ever or forever and ever. Amen. Now, we wanted to make that connection from um, Revelation, because it's very important now to understand that we're speaking about the kingdom of the priesthood. We're speaking about the millennial kingdom of the priesthood. You see, all of this was rehearsal. You understand? All of this is rehearsal. You understand? For that time to come when, when, when that number, you understand? When that number is fulfilled, and I and I pray, each of us should pray that we would be found worthy to stand before the Son of Man. In other words, for, for us to be able to be represented, for us to be found worthy of that high honor, you understand, of the kingdom of the priesthood. But what about this matter about the dead? You understand, it says not to defile yourself. What does the dead mean in this context? Because we see the dead is spoken of here, and then it says that Yeshua HaMoshiach is what the first begotten of the dead. Well, before I and I was born again, in him, in Yeshua HaMoshiach, to the glory of Kedus Abba to the glory of Abba Kedus in spirit and in truth, we were dead. You understand, spiritually dead, you see? So when we look at this dead, we can look at it in the Old Testament sense with a veil still over our eyes, just looking at the physical death, you understand, or just the body consciousness, or we can now look at it in its true sense in Christ and recognize that the dead, you understand, are those who are without the life of Christ. You understand? They are without that, 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 that my men in their heart. They're without that confession, you understand, of their mouth, that, that, that confession to salvation. So they are still dead in their sins because they have not received his, his blood, the blood and fire tribe. You understand? They have not received that life, so they're still dead. Their consciousness is dead to this reality. So we're not to defile ourselves for those around us who are dead. It don't mean we hate on them. 
but we're not to defile ourselves. So we have to meditate on what does that mean. You understand? What does that mean in our present situation? In other words, each of us, what does it mean in principle? But now, how are we to interpret that in our individual walk and in our collective walk? This is what's very interesting right here. Now, as we move on, we had pause at the first word right here where it says to the priest. Now, remember, this is speaking to the priest. So this is to be interpreted. This is speaking to the true Melchizedek order. You know, enough Rastafari brethren and even sister in, but mainly brethren asked about, what about Melchizedek? What do you think about Melchizedek, the Melchizedek order? This is all the foundation for the Melchizedek order. Remember, the priesthood has been changed, right, from, from Lewi, you understand, to Judah to the line of the tribe of Judah, to Moah, and Bessah, the Imam, the Gedah, Yehuda. You know what I'm saying? Yet the pattern, according to Hebrews chapter 7, yet the pattern is according to Levi. So this is why this book of Leviticus is so very important to understand it in, in spirit and in truth. Now, here it's saying to the priests, right, first of all, don't defy yourself for the dead ones. You understand? Know There's some exceptions to be made, but don't make baldness. That's what we say, fire bond. You understand? Don't make no baldness upon their heads. Neither shall they shave off the corner of their beards, nor make any cuttings in their flesh. And that's to be connected with the context of for the dead. It's interesting because the bald head thing, you know, is a popular thing. The little goatee thing nowadays is a popular thing among those who are spiritually dead of the true Christ consciousness. Now, in verse 7, it says right here, it says, They shall not take a wife that is a whore. They shall not take a wife that is a whore or profane. Neither shall they take a woman put away from her husband, for he is holy. He is caduced to his God. So this is very interesting as well, too, because it, it, it now saying that we as true Rastafari have to be circumspect. That, that, that certain type of things we might have done or used to do, certain type of associate, if we truly are seeking to be in the Melchizedek order, you understand, which is of Moa Anbessa, the Emnegeta Yehuda, the conquering line of the tribe of Judah. You can't take a woman or a wife in that sense, which is a what? A whore or profane. That means living according to the seclora. If she was living according to Seclorum and she's come out and she's put that behind her, that's a whole different thing in Christ, in the Moshiach. But if one is still living according to the dictates of the world, Rastafari, I and I not to be following after that. And unfortunately, many of us not knowing this have got caught up in a lot of these different type of situations and we're asking, you know, Yeshua, you know, to... Um, balance the equation as it were you understand for us so that as it says right here for he is holy to his god so that i and i may be holy caduce to i and i god right thou shalt sanctify him therefore for he offereth the bread of thy god now the bread very interesting he shall be holy to thee for I, Yahweh, which sanctifieth you, am holy. In other words, for it is Jah who is, who, he is the one that sanctifieth us. So although we are caduce, he is the one that makes us caduce. You understand? He is the one that makes us caduce in spirit and in truth. All right? Verse 9. And the daughter of any priest... This is, a, this is deep right here, because this will explain to you, also, when you read in Revelation, let us, let us get some of the bread of our job. Mm -hmm. When you read in the book of Revelation, when it says that Babylon is burned by fire, I'm sure you're familiar with it. In Revelation, you can study it with so about the judgment of Babylon, how she will be burnt by fire. Now, it's very interesting right here in verse 9. It says, And the daughter of any priest 
if she profane herself by playing the whore, she profaneth her father, she shall be burnt with fire. She shall be burnt with fire. That's why I say to some of y'all, you know, if, you know, these mix of situations that before you you got conscious to the truth, you have to separate yourself from from a lot of these things. You understand? Know Sometimes people don't understand why. You see, it's like if I and I is a, am a priest and I and I have a daughter. You understand? That I means a physical seed, a youth, and and she played a whore. According to this, she shall be burnt by fire. Now we can interpret it. In, in a physical fire sense, we can interpret it in a psychological fire sense, or it can be interpreted the highest, the spiritual fire sense. Either way, it kind of explains to us why Babylon, because Babylon is, is a daughter in a sense. You, when you think about it, it's, it's like a church on that sort of level. So when you, when you start to look at the interpretive, you see, if you interpret it on the physical level, if you interpret it on the more soul, psychic, or psychological level, if you interpret it on the spiritual level, on all those levels, it's one and the same in principle, but the manifestation is different. So this verse, verse 21 and 9, it explains why the judgment of Babylon, why the judgment against Babylon is fire, fire, right? Verse 10 says, And he that is the high priest among his brethren, upon whose head the anointing oil was poured, so the idea of the pouring out, right? And he shall pour out upon us his, his spirit, according to Joel. And that is consecrated to put on the garments. That is consecrated, is made holy to put on the garments, shall not uncover his head, nor rent his clothes. Neither shall he go in to any dead body, nor defile himself for his father or for his mother. Now, something strange I had heard on the internet, actually was brought to our attention, I was talking about in Egypt, modern Egypt, that they passed some law when, where men, so-called in Egypt, could have sex with their dead wives. Uh, we, we, we could run that story for you all in case you're, you could probably search it on the internet, Google it. It was just so weird, like some sort of necro, necromancy or some, some sickness there. Now, one would read this and say, well, who would do that? But then even in this present time, we see there's many folks who do that. So we recognize the veritas, the truth of this word right here. It says, neither shall he go into any dead body nor defile himself for his father or for his mother. Neither shall he go out of the sanctuary. He should not go out of the Mekdes, nor profane the Mekdes of his God, of Amlaku. Right? For the crown of the anointing oil of his God is upon him. Then it says, I am the Lord. I am Yahweh in verse 12. Now, my people, what is very significant about this? What is significant about this particular verse right here? What is significant, excuse me, what's significant about this? That says that he should not go out of the sanctuary. You know when Revelation says he should go no more out? He should not go out of the holy place. Not just the physical holy place, but he should not go out of the holy consciousness. When you, when you put it into the true spirituality context, he should not go out of the holy place. He should no more go out. Then it says, nor profane the sanctuary of his God. For the crown, the reason being for the crown of the anointing oil of his God is upon, uh, is upon him. I am Yahweh. Now, that's interesting because the revelation says, excuse me, let no man take your crown. Let no man 
take your crown because your crown has been given to you by Jah. It's not just talking about just the locks, although that is a symbol. You understand? But let no man take that 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 spiritual anointing crown of your consciousness. You understand? It's similar to when Paul says, you know, don't let them use this, their philosophies. You know, their worldly philosophies or other things to fool you or con you or deceive you. Don't be deceived by those things and lose that crown of your anointing. Because it's anointing oil. Anointing is christina. You know, it's christina. You understand? Uh, your christening. You understand? Not just the physical christening, but it's speaking spiritual. Remember, at the highest point in Christ, in the Moshiach, this is to be interpreted spiritually. Not like just the Old Testament, where it was the physical types were types of Christ. See, that's what you have to keep in your consciousness when you are interpreting this word. You have to see it in Yeshua. You have to see it in Christ and through Christ in order to get the true context of it. Now, let's move on with this. We're going to go through this chapter in, in, in a little bit of detail because this is very, very important to at least get a good groundation of this. All right, because if we fail to understand this, right, and fail to understand this concerning the priest, then we will fail to understand the true order of Melchizedek. You understand? How does it operate? You understand? Not just as an outer thing, but first in its inner sense. You understand? Each one of us has to Kabbalah it, Kabbalah, receive it in our inner sense. You understand? So that when we do gather together, you understand? When we gather together, um, there is a full consciousness, and that's what creates the true spiritual community. Not just we just gather in, in ignorance. You understand? And 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 without doing our own work, our spiritual home work, which is hearing the word which is reading the Word, which is studying the Word, which is memorizing the Word, and which is meditating on the Word day and night. You can't meditate on something that you haven't memorized or you don't have in your mind state, right? And you can't memorize something you, that you have not studied, right? And you can't study something that you haven't read, you understand? In a sense, you cannot read something that you have not spiritually shimmered or heard. Yovas, that's why that witness of Yeshua is, is the key. It's very, very important. The shema is, is, is important. Shema Yisrael, Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh Ahad. And this is the, this is the sign of blessing among Yeshua HaMoshiach, Disciples. This is the sign of blessing among the priesthood. I know you see this in the movies and in Star Trek as a live long and prosper. You understand? But this was taken from ancient Judaism. Overstand that if you will. Verse 13 says, let's get to the verse 13, 21, 13. It says, and he shall take a wife in her virginity. So the priests are to take wives, we as priests are to take wives in their virginity. Does this just mean physical virginity? Was it just speaking of physical virginity? No, my brothers and sisters, do, do not, remember, in Christ. Now, in the Old Testament physical sense, remember, they went from low degrees to high degrees. So we're studying the principles that were disclosed at these low degrees, but we have to understand it at the highest degree. In that virginity, it's like in the, um, just in the morning when it says, you are virgin in, 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 in mind, virgin in body. You know, um, be-asabish din ganesh, um, be-asabish in your mind, din ganesh, um, be-sagashim, and in your flesh, dinglenesh. That's a principle there. You understand? That's a code. That 
when you are virgin in mind, in your consciousness, you purified, you 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 have cultivated, you know what I'm saying, cultivated the soil, the, the the good ground. When you put that seed and cultivate the ground, it grows. It is virgin soil. You know what I'm saying? So is there a way that one, even if physically they have lost their virginity, they can reclaim spiritually their virgin, virginity? Yes. Yes, my brothers and sisters. See, the world tells you something different. Remember, we've been speaking about how the world will fool you because the God of the world is Satan on the devil. Second Corinthians 4 and 4 compared with Revelation, I think, 12 and 9. You'll see that there. Recognize the veritas of it. So here it says, and he shall take a wife in her virginity. It says a widow or a divorced woman or profane or an harlot. These shall he not take. But he shall take a virgin of his own people to wife. That's also a key for the priest, for the priesthood. So when we speak about the holy priesthood, is it to take a woman of his own people? Is that just speaking racially? No, it's speaking spiritually. You understand? And that's why it says, do not um, be unequally yoked. You understand? You are of the people, you are of the... You are a person of Jah, you know what I'm saying? And the other one is a person of Lucifer or Satan of the world, you know what I'm saying? Those are those unequal yokes, you know what I'm saying? And, and I know many ones are in different situations. The first thing one needs to do is to quietly take it up in prayer and meditation, you know what I'm saying? Prayer and meditation, and as Christ says, go into your closet, not to pray in front of, of people, you know what I'm saying? Or in front of so-called unbelievers. And you don't even have to pray out with it. You could pray in your heart and your mind. Overstand that, my brothers and sisters. It's not the outer, but it's the inner, the inner sense. Verse 15 says, Neither shall he profane his seed among his people. His seed, his race among his people. For I, Yahweh, do sanctify him. I set him apart to be caduce. Yah is setting us apart to for his service, for Jah's service. Now, it then goes on to speak on the physical disqualifications of a priest, which are interesting, although they're represented here as physical disqualifications, we can and must understand these as spiritual disqualification, when we understand the, 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 the type, then in Yeshua HaMoshiach, we can understand the true spirituality. Now, these verses here, they illustrate Old Testament holiness and sanctification. A person set apart for the service of God. You know what I'm saying? Not the service of Babylon, not the service of the world, but set apart for the service of Jah. So it says in verse 16, And Yahweh spake to Musa, saying, Speak to Aaron, saying, So you can see the chain of command. Jah speaks to Moses. Moses speaks to Aaron. And this is what it said, Whosoever he be of thy seed, of thy race, in their generations that have any blemish, let him not approach to offer the bread of his God. That, that, you know, in the New Testament, it speaks about um, being spotted with the world. You know what I'm saying? Being spotted with the worldliness. That ble those blemishes, you know what I'm saying? It's still having that, the world worth shipping the world or its precepts. You know, we have to be in the world but not of the world. But many are in the world and they're of the world. That is a blemish. For whatsoever man he be that hath a blemish, he shall not approach. He cannot approach. You know what I'm saying? He has to stay where, where he's at. He cannot approach. A blind man or a lame or he that hath a flat nose. Now, some go off on this and say, oh, 
this was racist because it's speaking about they're not understanding this well. Or anything superfluous. Or a man that has a broken foot, uh, that is broken footed, or broken handed, or crook backed, or a dwarf or that has a blemish in his eye, or be scurvy, or scab, or has his stones broken. You know, the stones are speaking about the scrotum, the balls broken. I mean, people say, well, what is it about? That's what it's about. But now, over, over this, Yeshua came healing. He came healing the, the, the blind. Now, Spiritually speaking, there's many who are blind. They can see physically. They may have 20-20 vision physically. But spiritually, they are blind. Spiritually, they are broken-footed. You understand? They cannot walk and do the ministry. You understand? They are broken hand. You understand? They, they, they don't write. You understand? Like writing, we've been speaking about how important writing is. You understand? So it's all about the ones who are lame. You know what I'm saying? They are lame in the way of Christ. Or in this level, they're lame in the way of Rastafari. Yeah, they are Rastafari, Rasta, Jaja, Selassie, but they're lame. According to John's standard, they're lame. What they're doing, calling it Rasta or whatever, is lame. It's blind. You understand? Know it's like they got scurvy. You understand? Know Flat nose, super, super fluid, broken footed. You understand? Know Can't really walk John's way. You understand? So if somebody broken footed, they, they they can't walk the path. You understand? Straightly. Something's funny with their walk. They're broken handed. You understand? They can't write. They, or, or, or they don't use their hand to do John's work. You understand? Something's broken with their hand. It says, no man that hath a blemish of the seed of Aaron the priest shall come nigh near to offer the offerings of Yahweh made by fire. He has a blemish. In other words, he has something that according to the Moshiach standard, and, and we can go through the testimony and see the connection with this as we look into the New Testament and we compare the word by the word. It says, he has a blemish. He should not come nigh to offer the bread of his God. In other words, he cannot offer the bread, the lamb's bread. You know when we speak about how the Kana Bush, the Kana Besim, is not for everybody, at least not in the sacramental sense. Maybe on the medicinal level, you know, they have some other disease of the physical body and therefore it's healing in that sense. But to offer the the lamb's bread, they cannot. It's very clear right here. You understand? He shall eat the bread of his God, both the most holy and of the holy. Only he shall not go into the veil. He cannot penetrate the veil. Remember, it says the veil is still over their eyes. You understand? But the veil is done away with in the Moshiach. In Christ, the veil is done away with in Christ. Verse 28, 23, excuse me. Only he shall not go into the veil. You understand? So he can eat the bread. He can eat the bread, but he cannot offer the bread. He can eat the bread of the most holy and of the holy. Only he shall not go into the veil, nor come nigh to the altar. He can't come near to that altar. Because... He hath a blemish, that he profane not my sanctuaries, my sanctuaries, here it's plural, for I, the Lord, do sanctify them. Verse 24, to conclude this chapter right here, and Musa told it. Now Musa, Moses heard, Yahweh told him. Now Moses is telling this to Aaron and to his sons and to all the children of Israel. Amos 9 and 7, aren't ye like unto the children of the Ethiopians unto me, O children of Israel? Stay tuned, brothers and sisters. We just dealt with this chapter. We're going to go over a little bit more with, with you on this. Um, 
this portion right here we was going to summarize from this portion but we already know that this parasha it provides purity rules the purity rules for the priest it recounts the holy days coming up in the next part the holy days it provides for light lights and bread you know was the oil for the lamps and, and, and the bread in the Mekdes, in the sanctuary. And it tells a story coming up, telling the story of a blasphemer, those who blaspheme the King of Kings and his Christ, and his punishment. So we just dealt with the first part, the rules for the priests, but coming up the holy days, lights and bread in the sanctuary, and the story of the blasphemer and the blasphemer's punishment. So stay tuned, brothers and sisters. More to come, Yah willing. In this Vayikra, the Hebrew book of Leviticus. Shalom Ras Tefari.